Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a slightly late start for another Squawk Talk on Sasha's Telly. Uh, I'm Steve from Squawk Box. Uh, I'm my colleagues, Bonnie and Demo, here from Sasha's Telly, and two very special guests uh, joining us from the Baker's Food and Allied Workers Union, or Baker's for short. Uh, we have the uh, union's new general secretary, Sarah Woolley, and we have Ian Hudson, who's been on the show before. Uh, welcome to everybody. Thank you for making time. And as usual, at the top of the program, I'll just say, if you're not following us yet on your social media, then do make sure to put that right and hit the notification icon so that uh, you can keep up with our content and do share so everybody else can as well. Uh, so welcome, everybody, you uh, to Baker's Clock are looking uh, surprisingly well for the end of the day at conference. I know, uh, I know how I normally feel if I got to the Labour one, et cetera. But um, tell us a little bit about what's going on. I guess the, uh, the big headline thing at the moment is the... Uh, result of the consultation that you did with your members uh, on the um, on their opinion of the Labour Party at the moment. So tell us a little bit about uh, what came out, out of that and what that's going to spin off to uh, in the uh, conference this week. So so the, the reason for the survey actually was due to the decision by Keir Starmer last year to support the government's move from uh, the two metre to one metre plus. Uh, that had a massive impact um, and on our members who had boiled through the pandemic. I mean, they felt very let down uh, because they didn't feel that the Labour Party should have just responded in the way that they did at the dispatch box to agree to that without actually doing any research into um, what the risks were. I mean, our members have demonstrated that, that uh, you could actually, you know, run uh, a business with putting safety measures in place to protect people's lives. And they just thought very badly let down by the position uh, that Keir Starmer took. And when we subsequently asked why, you know, he responded in that way, why he hadn't consulted with any um, of the trade unions who were affiliated, the response we got back from his office was that Keir Starmer couldn't be seen not to be responding to Boris Johnson's proposals. I mean, which we thought was, was a shocking justification. Uh, and this should have been putting people's lives first. And we had a number of our members get in contact, um, very upset and, and demanding that the union took action in relation to our relationship. And we got told there was going to be uh, loads and loads of motions coming our way to disaffiliate. So we made a decision as an executive um, to survey our members and we had a significant response to that survey, which we were pleased about. Um, and some interesting figures came out of that. So when you say significant response, I mean, what level of, uh, of, of answers from people, what level of uh, in interest from people did you get? So, so I mean, on average, you would, you would normally get a couple of hundred people on a, on a responding on a survey. I mean, we, we, got, we got in excess of 400 people responding to our survey. I mean, obviously, our membership... Um, is uh, it's just short of just short of uh, seventeen thousand. We we sent out somewhere in the regions about seven thousand uh, surveys to our members for those people who we've got on emails. And you know, for for us, that's the highest return on any survey we've conducted. Um, and there was a passion there on on, the, on those results that, that demonstrated our people are interested in politics. Um, there was an understanding too of their view of, of the Labour Party, which obviously we followed up from those surveys with, with discussions with our members too, to find out some of the background about why they made the choices that they made. And uh, do you want to give us a few of those numbers or shall I read them out? I mean, you, you they came I mean, up I mean, in, the, uh, in the Morning Star yesterday, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, if you can read them out, because I'm now, I, I, can, I can respond to that because I can't remember them off the top of my head. <laughs> yes, no worries. So, uh, well, the headlines were uh, that only 7% uh, of the members strongly believe that Labour still represents their interests. Um, there was a drop of, I think, from 53% to 8% of people who uh, would vote Labour at the moment, although that could potentially go up, they said, if, uh, if Labour had a better, better leader. And a majority, 51%, who felt that the party, you know, it wasn't just that they didn't strongly believe that the party represents their interest, but they uh, definitively didn't believe that Labour uh, represents their interest anymore, uh, which will certainly make for some uh, interesting uh, and interesting results potentially this week if uh, if those motions to uh, 
to disaffiliate come up so i mean what what do you make of that and what's what's the driver behind it i mean in the consultation you know you raised the issue of the uh covid strategy and you know keir starmer being uh, joined at the hip with boris johnson in, in that largely but you also raised stuff like landlords uh the spy cops bill and other things like that as well so you know why, why do you think so few members uh feel that the union supports them uh that the uh labor party sorry represents them and that um the, excuse me <laughs> slip of, slip of the tongue and um you know what 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 do you think that's going to result in this week then when these uh when these motions come to the floor so so because we, we because we did the survey what what seems to have happened is the motion has never came forward because people saw that the executive was responding and, and obviously what they've done is they've allowed that survey to be conducted um and as i say in the, the statement that we we've uh, we released over the weekend uh, the problem is now is that unless there is a, a significant response from the labor party our members feel so disenfranchised that that we will receive and we know it's going to it's going to happen probably either at next year's conference or or, or, or future conference here, there will be motions brought to disaffiliate I mean, today we held meetings um, of our members and, and we brought Richard Bergen along to talk about why politics um, is, is necessary and, and why it's important to be something we discuss in our workplaces. And, and on that, that discussion we had with Richard, I mean, our members were raising, you know, not just the issues we talked about in the brief, but issues around, you know, the failure of, of, of um, Keir Starmer to to uh, resolve the, the the islamophobia problem you know the failure um to understand that the, the working class people do take international issues seriously the fact that there doesn't seem to be any real strategy about engaging and listening to the voices of working class people and seems to be all focused on focus groups well and they feel their voices now um, are, 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 are not relevant to the Labour Party's current direction of travel. Bonnie, you were looking deep and thought there was anything you wanted to ask or come in with? So. Uh, yeah, no, I was just thinking, what a shame, what a turn of events that the political party that was formed to be the political wing of the trade union movement is not representing workers anymore. We're hearing it time and time again across so many of our trade unions and that's what's so disappointing because you know our members have worked ridiculously hard through this pandemic keeping the nation fed and the, the, the least they deserve is for the the leader of the labor party the, the 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 party that's supposed to represent the working class to listen to them to take to take note of what they're saying and um, to talk to us um about that but, you know, Ian mentioned about just making decisions from going from two metre to one metre plus um, social distancing measures. Where did that come from? Because he was certainly not talking to our members that were working next to each other on production lines with safety measures in place in, in shops selling food. It was just a decision he made by himself. It, one, what it looks like from our members. And, and we all know the consequences of those actions. I mean, we have more deaths in the, because we went into the second lockdown than we did in the first. You know, I mean, because relaxation of those safety measures, you know, costs lives. You know, and I, I think our members, you know, were right to raise that issue and right to challenge the position of the Labour Party. I mean, and, and, you, and you know, when you talk about the Labour Party, I mean, our relationship with the Labour Party actually starts in 1893, when we used to be known as journeymen, you know, we're, we're being addressed by, by Keir Hardy uh, in London, because we were on strike, you know, there was a there was a there was a strike action that took place, and Keir Hardy came and addressed them. I mean, we was we was winning seats as independent Labour in 1902 in places like Barnsley, you know. I mean, so we, it's not like we're 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 in a new relationship with the Labour Party that only happened a couple of years ago. We we have a longevity with the party, and and you know we're a campaigning organisation. We're a campaigning trade union. You know, we're one of the first unions to, to accept women as full members. We were the, one of the first unions to, to make sure that when people worked in, in our industry, the equal pay, you know, was, was, was resolved in the 60s, you know, and early 70s. You know, we, we were a campaigning union that recognises 
that, that it's wrong to ignore the unorganised sectors of our community because it comes becomes too difficult to organise places like McDonald's or Weather Street, so we just don't bother doing it. You know, we're a union that says actually accepting zero hours is is is, is okay. We said that we would challenge back. We did challenge back, and again, our members went on strike, and I think it was the only strike that's ever happened against the use of zero hours contracts and won. You know, um, I mean, you know, we, we said it was wrong to discriminate against young workers. You know, those, those these are our campaigns. I mean, when we when we launched the, the call for ten pound an hour, we were we, we were we were called militants and, and extremists for daring to suggest that you know there should be a, a minimum wage of no less than ten pound an hour. I mean, obviously, we, we saw that as so 2014. We're calling for fifteen pound an hour now because people deserve the right to live with dignity. Um, and be able to afford, you know, to put food on the table, to afford to be able to support their families. And, and what, we're, what we're saying is, is those should be the core values of the Labour Party, because that's supposed to be what they stand for, the ambition of our class to promote the interests of, of working people. So, Terry, I'll go on, Debra, you go on. Yeah, no, I was just going to jump in and say, um, you know, all... You, you mentioned that your, your union is a, a campaigning union. I think all trade unions, frankly, ought to be, and all members of the Labour Party should be uh, supporting them in that. Um, Keir Starmer seems to repeatedly always have an excuse for uh, not doing this or not doing that or not supporting this or not supporting that. It's little wonder your members are feeling so disgruntled, quite frankly, because I think that, that's reflective of the, the Labour movement as a whole. I think a great deal of the membership are fed up with him. I mean, I've, I've been quite vocal in my fed upness of, of, of the chat myself. Um, what's your opinion on him um, hanging in there, quite frankly? I mean, he, he's, he's lost one by election. He's, he's looking set to lose another one. Do you think he's going to hang in there? Do you think he ought to go? Do you think he ought to have gone by now? Are your own opinions going along the same lines as your membership, perhaps, based on the, the figures that have been read out here today? I mean, what I would say about, about Sir Keir Starmer uh, is, is, is this. In 2019, Keir Starmer was standing on picket lines with McStrikers, you know, McDonald's workers who were on strike. I mean, now we'd wait from us from a window because he doesn't think he needs to in, engage with us. You know, I mean, th there's been a number of times when there's been a suggestion that we would have meetings and those meetings have been cancelled because obviously he doesn't see us as being relevant to the Labour Party. I'm not here to defend Keir Starmer. I'm here to defend um, our members. You know, and, and we, we have this belief and, and, and an understanding that, that, you know, the Labour Party is supposed to represent the interests of our class. It's supposed to fight and stand up for us. And our members certainly don't feel that that's happening. And the book has to stop with, with Keir Starmer, who stood on a platform, who committed himself and said he was going to rebuild trust. And then the first thing he does is he jettisons the things that he stood on, which people voted for. That doesn't build trust. People see that as a deceitful act. And, you know, if you're going to be deceitful, then you have to take responsibility for it, especially when you claim to be the most forensic uh, politician in Parliament. And a forensic politician in Parliament wouldn't respond because he feels it's the right thing to do because he doesn't want to be seen not saying anything back. A forensic person would turn around and say, as I would say in a meeting with management, if they put something on the table to me and I didn't know what the, what the, what the outcome would that would likely be without having the knowledge, which he claimed he didn't have sight of, although if you listen to the speech that he gave in Parliament on that day, he thanked Boris Johnson for giving pre-sight of the document that was about to be announced. So he did have an opportunity uh, to contact, at least contact the TUC, who had been leading uh, on the issue of health and safety. And by the way, the TUC have done a phenomenal job uh, during this pandemic of protecting workers and making sure unions have received the support and the resources uh, that we've needed to get us through this pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if we only have to look at how Jeremy was treated, and he wouldn't have been allowed to stop it on any position, would it? Yeah, it'd be quite, uh, quite a state of affairs, really, if um, the Baker's affiliation with the Labour Party started with Keir Hardy and ended with Keir Starmer, really, wouldn't it? But, I mean, Sarah, as the new General Secretary then, I mean, given that you moved, you know, you've come into a, you know, that job in a union that's had such a history with the party, how, how would it feel then to be re leading it, taking it forward, if that, if that had ended within the first short period of you, uh, you were in the seat? Not, not your fault, but obviously... Uh, 
you know, as a, as a change of environment, change of outlook or whatever. I mean, don't get me wrong, when I started the role last year, you know, I was clear I wanted to be working together. We're a Labour movement. We need to be working together. The Labour Party is, is designed to be our voice in Parliament, you know. Um, but our members make the decisions for our trade union, not me. And if, if they had put motions to conference and had voted to disaffiliate, then we would have had to have de dealt with that as a trade union and moved on um, collectively. It, would it have been easy? Probably not, but that's what democracy is all about, isn't it? Um, our members make the decisions at, at our annual conference. Now, I did read that um, Baker's representation on the on the Labour Party National Executive was under threat with the uh, right wing unions targeting and trying to kind of oust, oust you and grab your seat or whatever. So I guess if, if things go as they might do this week, you'll, you'll save them the trouble in that sense. So, but, you know, I mean, let's <sighs> Labour's this kind of dire situation at the minute, but you've got some really positive stuff going on that you were telling us uh, just before the show about. So. Give, give everybody a little bit of a feel as to what's going on in that, you know, connected to kind of right to food and obviously the welfare of all your members who are, you know, genuine frontline workers but don't get recognised as such. You know. Yeah, so um, earlier this year we met with Ian Burns and we spoke to our um, Executive Council about the work that he was doing about the right to food and our Executive Council unanimously said we've got to support this campaign. And the first thing we did was put a survey out to our members to see you know, how the, the pandemic had impacted them, how they survived under normal circumstances. And, and, and to be quite honest, the, the results that came back from that survey were shocking. You know, 40% of the respondents ran out of food because there's not enough money to, to be able to pay for it throughout the month. Um, one in five were relying on friends and, and family to, to provide them with food so that the that could feed the, the cells and their families. And, and, and I think about 35% were eating less so that, you know, the kids and, and other members of the family had food to be able to eat. Now, that's disgusting in 2021. And, and, and these people have worked through a global pandemic, making sure that the nation has kept themselves fed, yet can't afford to, to purchase the, the food and the products they're producing, you know, and and this is just the tip of the iceberg, and we know it is because we surveyed our members and, and, and opened it out to, to the wider industry, but we know those ununionized workplaces will have been in an even worse situation. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're, we're speaking to some academics about what we need to focus on in our industry, because as I mentioned this morning in, in my, my speech to, to conference amongst other things was uh, the food industry is, is, is the biggest manufacturing unit in the UK. It, it contributes to our economy more than any other aspect. Yet our members throughout this pandemic have been the forgotten key workers. They've been the ones that have been in the background producing food. And quite rightly, you know, NHS workers have, 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 have been praised for the work that they've done. And, and quite rightly so. But without food, nobody would have survived this pandemic. Mm. But we've not had specific claps for food workers. Um, in fact, our food workers have been going hungry through, through this pandemic. So we're going to look at what aspects of, of legislation we need to look at and how we, how we put pressure on the government to, to put investment into our, our, our industry. Because, you know, when you look at other other sectors like gas um, and, and motor vehicles, they get investment from, from the government to be able to upgrade their lines and, and be greener and cleaner. In our industry, it comes from the profits of, of the employers, which in turn impacts the increases in the better terms and conditions of pay of our members. So we've got a big piece of work to go with going forwards, but you know it, what we've seen this week with our members is they're engaged with this and, and they want to improve their lives and, and their branches' lives. Um, and that's what we want to do as well. And, and alongside that, we, um, we want to change the narrative of our industry. So for many years, it's been known as, you know, you go work in the food industry because it's unskilled and, and you can't get a job anywhere else. And as I told our, our members this morning at the conference, 
I'm proud to have come from the food industry. I'm proud to have worked at Greg's. You know, not many people can make 65 sandwiches an hour. Not many people can stand at the end of an oven for a 12 hour shift removing hot, hot, hot trays with bread in um, and tipping them out or boxing up fondant fancies or even putting cherries on a baked or tart. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody can deal with queues of customers that are a grumpy or that they've had a drink or two because they're not getting served quick enough. You don't need a university degree to do any of that. That doesn't mean to say it's not skilled. So we want our members and the people that work in the food industry to be proud of the fact that they are part of the biggest manufacturing unit in the UK. And that's what we're going to be doing over the, the near future and the distant future is reinventing what people think about when they think about the food industry. Because our members deserve better. 100% agree. I mean, I think the interesting thing is, you know, with, with through the pandemic, I think there was this kind of lifting of the lid a little bit on the on the box to people to look in and see what a job is really worth and what kind of jobs are really worth something and then the jobs that get the high pay. Um, and I think that that started to shift and then the government's been doing everything it could to scramble back from that now and, you know, undo, you know, close Pandora's box again in that sense, but hopefully they can't. You know, they're, they're massive insult to the nurses where, you know, and, and other people in the public sector where they did all this stuff and then uh, get hit with this measly, you know, 1% pay rise or whatever. And, uh, you know, I think it's people have a better appreciation now as to how much they rely on people in stuff like that, you know, in the food industry and so on. And I will have to ask for my own education apart from anything. But, you know, bakers and food is... is Pretty self-explanatory, but Allied, how what you know, what kind of things does Allied cover? So, so is anything associated with the with the food sector? Although, um, because because obviously people uh, do um, like the fact that the the union is a campaigning union. The union has campaigned around issues of low pay, has campaigned around ending um, discrimination against young workers, has stood up against uh, the use of zero hours contracts. You know, we we get. I mean, we, we're currently organising interpreters in in Scotland. Uh, so so you know, and a lot of them will go and interpret in factories where there's a lot of a lot of migrant food workers, for example, uh, to make sure that they're they're able to get represented. And those those workers obviously also had had issues with with not being treated fairly, being paid below uh, the minimum wage, and started organising and become part of the Baker's Food and Allied Workers Union. You know, we've had we've had people from 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 Freshies join us. So we've had you know Freshies that unionised as the Baker's Food and Allied Workers Union. We've allied as well, you know, in the hospitality sector, you know, the fast food sector. You know, I mean, um, we we we've been able to to you know recruit people from various walks of life um, because of because of the stands that we've we've made. Um, so, so allied now just means, you know, if you believe in the principles of the Vegas Food and Allied Workers Union, you're welcome to join us. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, I mean, that well. the next question. That I, I presume a, a, a big recruitment drive is on the menu, um, and I use that word deliberately, <laughs> uh, that, that, you know, to, to try to get more in because it's a, it's a massive sector, as you say. So, I mean, obviously there's plenty of room there for more people to join who are not necessarily enjoying the benefits of a, you know, uh, uh, that come with union membership and the ability for kind of collective action and self-protection, et cetera, as well. So, I mean, what plans have you got? What would you say to people? Give you, give you kind of a uh, two-minute recruitment pitch now because I know you've got to get off in a little while and uh, tell people what what would, you know, how would it benefit them if they joined the Bakers? So, so I mean, obviously, pe people have seen what we've been doing recent years i mean obviously you know it's not all about strikes either although we've, we've we've done quite a number and obviously in sectors which have never been on strike before so when that when our members went out striking in weatherspoons for example what those people won by standing up in brighton was they they won uh, late night shift pay so they got an extra pound an hour when they worked past um 11 o'clock at night which they never used to get they they had an increase in their pay brought forward uh, which they weren't going to get for, for six months we improved the health and safety. When the people went on strike in McDonald's, what they succeeded in, in, in achieving was, was, was offers of contracts of employment. What they also saw was the biggest pay rise that they've ever been offered um, by 
um, McDonald's in this country. You know, but it's not all about strikes. It's about organising. It's about empowerment and understanding that we are stronger when we act collectively. And victories come because we are strong in that workplace. Victories come when we stand together in solidarity. We, we organise to protect ourselves and to protect one another. So joining a trade union, and it doesn't have to be our trade union, it can be any trade union that, 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 that works in, in your industry, is, is critical if we're to improve ourselves, our communities, and, and you know the wider population. If we want a fairer, better society, the only way we're going to do it as working class people is by coming together and organising, standing together and winning together. I think Bonnie's got a question. I'll just say to you, there, we are getting a few people commenting and saying, uh, can we sort out Sarah's echo? And I'll just say that's, you know, that's a lot better than it was at the, <laughs> just before we started the program. So uh, there's a few kind of logistical issues at, the, at that end, I think. But, uh, you know, we've got it as good as we can. So do bear with us because what these guys are saying is, is well worth hearing. So, Bonnie, what, what was your question? Yeah, thanks. It sort of leads on to your last question there, Steve. Over the history of the Bakers Union, we've gone from abject poverty for the working class and workhouses and all of those awful things when you were first formed. We've seen the rise of trade unionism and we've seen the gains made through trade unionism for working class people because of the collective efforts of each of the trade unions that we have in existence. But since Thatcher and the anti-trade union laws that were brought in from her, by most governments since that just time, we've seen it harder and harder to organise as trade unionists. And now we've almost come full circle with our terms and conditions been under attack since 1979. How do we reverse this? And as trade unions, can you identify, trade unionists, can you identify maybe three actions that working class people can take today or tomorrow to try and reverse this decline that we've been forced into? Yeah. We need to be talking about trade unions more. We need trade unions to be spoke about in schools because it's too late when you're in a, a crap job. Well, not swear, when you're in a crap job, um, you're there and you're stuck. And if you don't know what a trade union is, you've already got used to it. So, trade unions in schools is key. I mean, and, and obviously, you know. The, the, and, you know, I, I always, I always, I always harp back to the 1984 miners' strike. Uh, I mean, that was a, that was a telling point when the trade unions failed to stand up to protect well, the TUC more than the trade unions because most trade unions did support the miners. But we let ourselves down, and we've got to recognise it's solidarity that wins. It's supporting one another that wins. Our, our communities are stronger when we stand together, and we've got to really build those structures. And when we understand that, we'll win again. You know, but we win, but we don't hear about it. We've just won in Belfast. They've just won. You know, an 8% pay increase, food workers in Belfast jointly between Unite and the Baker's Food and Allied Workers Union. We turned the clock back on the use of zero hours in the company by our members going on strike to stop that. Collective action wins. Striking must win. And you know what? When we stand together, we will always win together. And you only have to look at our history to see that. That's how we created the NHS. That's how we built council houses and made sure people had decent homes to live in. That's how... You know, we build a better society. It's when we stand together, we will always win together. Solidarity will see us through. And, and speaking of that, uh, oh, going to the next uh, Speaking of that, you, uh, you just had a really good result in Northern Ireland, as well, haven't you? You were telling us about earlier on. And uh, it was a joint effort between you and Unite, which is a, a union close to our hearts as well. So tell us a little bit about what you managed to achieve there with the, with the solidarity and collective action. Okay, so so obviously um, the, the company's position originally was to um, to do a, a multi-year deal uh, of about two percent uh, a year, and then they went to um, to an offer of uh, two point two. Uh, but the members over there decided that that wasn't satisfactory. Their claim and their demand was was for ten percent. Um, the company didn't concede the ten percent, but it did concede eight, um, which is which is shows you the strength um, that people do have uh, with an employer. It shows that victories can be achieved, um, and obviously, you know, we 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 salute those workers, you know, both unite and ours. Uh, that took that courageous stand. 
you know, and also we'd like to send out, you know, to the crash workers over in Belfast who also came down and joined those picket lines. Uh, and also, you know, the message, the message of support, but also the Brandwee workers, you know, the JDE workers who are, you know, are facing fire and rehire, it sent over a card in solidarity to those workers. And obviously, you know, we, we, we thank them for their support and we send our solidarity to them too. Yeah, well, I mean, it's really interesting to say because I think you, you've got this um, situation where you needed that solidarity right on the on the front line, on the picket line, etc. as well. But there was also a legal victory that came in that was uh, really important in that because the police were trying to crack down on, on you all and disperse the picket line all the time, police the picket line because, you know, using the pandemic as an excuse. So tell us a little bit about what happened with all that. Fortunately, over an hour, everybody's a brother and sister. So obviously we got around that because it was a family bubble, um, but but clearly you know there was there was threats to to arrest the the two organising officers that, that were organising the strike, um, and you know they put police on the picket lines uh, with cameras to observe uh, what those workers were doing, and all they were doing was standing up for their rights to improve their pay, um, and you know they saw that through, you know even faced with that intimidation. You know, and obviously, I know Howard Beckett obviously moved and got that, that legislation here. And obviously, we, we're very grateful uh, to the work that Unite did on that and, and Howard in particular uh, for that success. Um, and obviously, we did use that, but it was challenged over there. But obviously, we was able to, to ensure that those workers, you know, was able to continue that strike and have a victory. And I think what it showed was, you know, you don't just have to be from one union. They stood together collectively across unions, and and that can be done. You know, it's not always a war and a fight and a and a. Well, these are our members and these are our members standing together collectively. The guys on the shop floor and the girls on the shop floor being the trade union um, achieved massive things. You know, um, and I think going back to your question, Bobby, about the three points. The third one's got to be getting people to understand what Ian was saying about the power of the collective not third party in the union and seeing them as these people that come in and save the day. Because people are stronger when they, when they stand together and the force change the more that's stuck with each other. Yeah, superb cool. guys. I think you've got to get off shortly, but um, just before you go then, uh, is there a website or whatever where people can log on to find out about the Right to Food campaign and the other stuff that you're doing? Similar to that, so if you go there, we'll direct you. I'll pop the uh, the union website address up. We lost you briefly there, but I think I got the gist of it. We'll pop that up in the uh, banner going on the bottom in a second, and uh, hopefully drive drive some people towards the site to to join up and, and get involved. So, thank you ever so much, folks, for your time. Really appreciate it. It's great to hear what's going on. Uh, do keep us updated what's going on with your uh, with your motions this week. And uh, you know, let's let's all keep it up together for the uh, you know for the second of the movement and the the working people. So, thanks ever so much. Uh, really appreciated your time, and uh, we'll see you again on the program soon, no doubt. Take care and congratulations, Sarah. Best of luck. Well, that was an interesting, uh, very interesting discussion, really. So, um, did just then sort of segue into uh, into the unite. A little bit into Unite there with the mention of, uh, you know, the win on the front line, uh, you know, on the legal line, let's say, about uh, the right to pick it uh, during, the, um, during the pandemic and the impact that that had, which, you know, fits in very nicely really with the, um, you know, the whole Unite situation uh, and what's going on this week. But, Demo, do you want to give us a quick recap? I know you've done a, a rant or two today on what's been going on. So give us, give us your thoughts on what's going on with the, uh, in, the, with, in the latest with that one. Well, it's Beckett or Bust. We did this Beckett or Bust um, thing on Twitter, didn't we? Or Unite for Beckett. And it took off. He trended. What a fantastic show of solidarity we saw for Howard across Twitter. And, you know, if you were like me and you were involved in that, thank you so much for, for doing so. Um, you might have often received a comment from somebody, though, saying that, you know, he needs to sit down. He's splitting the vote. The right wing is going to win. And this is a line that's been repeated by those supporting uh, one of the other candidates, uh, predominantly, it seems. Uh, and it just strikes me as odd. 
Um, yeah, the look at the nominations um, reasoning is the most often example they give. Um, well, all right, let's have a look at these nominations a moment. According to the nominations, the right winger came last. So if that's the case, then what's the problem? Either the nominations are, as is often made out, exactly as the vote will go, which is utter nonsense, obviously, but in which case nobody needs to drop out. Or they aren't, in which case you're holding nominations up as an example, but that's dishonest. But of course, the response could be that uh, the person that got the most nominations should be the one to go forward. This is what they keep saying. This is the candidate they're trying to get us to get behind. Repeatedly, we're told that it's the other two that should get get to, should drop out. But look, the thing with the nominations is only one candidate was actually completely transparent with the nominations that they got. And that was Howard Beckett. Every time a nomination came in for Howard, there was a graphic put up across social media saying thank you to whoever it was. And that candidate that got the most, well, he put some of them out, but but not all of them. And I just it just seems weird to me that he wouldn't want to thank all the branches that, uh, that nominated him, all the workplaces that nominated him. Uh, and I can't help but think, or were some more important to them than others? Or uh, is, there, is there something else going on behind it? We don't know because there's a lack of transparency here. And I fear for that. And I think the only reason this is going on is because actually that camp fears Beckett more than the right winger. They're not convinced, I don't think, they can beat Howard Beckett and what he stands for. Because well, for all their talk of unity, it assumes that left voters will all fall in behind their man. But that's not guaranteed. And I certainly won't because he hasn't convinced me. or he has, And he has certainly hasn't inspired me. And this is what the whole Beckett or Bust thing came out of. It is literally Beckett or Bust. So keep the contest open. Keep it fair. Encourage the participation. Let all four run. They all got on the ballot. Because I firmly believe that as things, turn, things stand, turnout is going to be really good because there's a huge uh, enthusiasm for this election this time. There's a lot of people who are active and inspired and enthused by this this time. And I believe turnout is going to improve. And actually, that's what make, will make this election different from any other. I think so. And I mean, you know, I'm, uh, I've got media inquiries in with a number of people of uh, the nominations that went in on, on their watch under under branches where the members say they were never consulted as to uh, who the branch was supposed to be going to nominate. And it seems to be quite a widespread thing that, you know, and then, you know, it's not only Steve, I don't, I don't think Sharon Graham thanked very many people. Certainly Coyne didn't make any kind of noise about any of the, the branches that nominated him, apart from the one that he's the chair of, as if I remember correctly. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, so, but, but in Steve Turner's case, I think it was, uh, it was less than 40% of the nomination number that he claims to have had he's ever got around to thanking anybody about. Um, and, you know, it does appear to be, uh, you know, certainly at least raise the question whether, um, you know, the nominations were done by, you know, two or three people in the branch who are part of his network and, uh, you know, or supporting his campaign or whatever decided they're going to announce that their branch is nominated, but not actually inform the members, let alone ask the members, uh, you know, what they what they think, which could be an explanation potentially for, you know, the reason that so many branches weren't named, um, because it would be a bit embarrassing to name a branch and then, you know, 20 people crop up from that branch saying, first we've heard about it. Um, so, you know, it might be, uh, it, it might tell a story. We don't know yet. We're, we're still trying to bottom that out. But certainly in terms of anybody trying to, use those numbers and we know you know one particular character who is uh to uh to claim that that's a democratic mandate in the thing is talking out of an alternative orifice because you know there's been very little democracy in a lot of these except in the ones as far as we can tell that nominated howard because the people that nominated howard beckett were very rapidly thanked explicitly for that and the members in the branches had plenty of opportunity to say not us gov or whatever you know if, if there'd been any issues with that um but i think it's you know that that's that's one side of things the other side i think is the difference between the campaigns and i said between rather than among even though there's four people in it because it very much is it's three on the one side and one on the other in terms of the approach to the union movement and union activism because uh you know on the on the one hand you've got three of them who are all in one form or another preaching this disengagement from anything but organizing in the workplace workplace organization, nothing else. We don't want to interfere in politics. We don't want to be worrying about politics. We don't want to be 
you know, we're, we're just a workplace organiser. Well, the, you know, on the other hand, you've got Howard Beckett, who is saying, no, we've got to have the legal, we've got to have the industrial, we've got to have the political. They've all got to work together for the good of our members to get the best best results for them. And, you know, I mean, the, the idea that it's only the workplace for one thing is a big insult to the 20,000 or so members of the union who are not in, you know, paid work in that sense, who are part of the community. There's a lot of members of the union who are in sector branches because they're not in a unionized workplace. So they're members of the union, but they can't organize in the workplace because that's not how their particular company works or whatever. Um, but you know, we've we've heard there just right at the end from uh, Ian about the situation in Northern Ireland, and you know this whole this dispute was going on for a long time. The members were under massive pressure, spied on by the police, getting hassled. The you know the organisers of the strike getting hassled, etc. Right until the moment where, and as he mentioned, it was particularly Howard Beckett through Unite who uh, you know who got that result won the legal right for them to strike during the pandemic. So the police were not allowed to treat them as though they were doing anything untoward anymore. They were legally entitled to do that and it had been recognised in the court of law. And at the moment that that happened, the employer folded in a split second and essentially then this offer comes in, which was you know, very nearly what the union was hoping to get and massively more, you know, four times bigger than the best offer that they'd made up to that point. And, uh, you know, and, and bang they've got the members if you hadn't had that you know if you didn't have somebody who knew their way around the courtroom fighting that corner and making that happen the, the dispute would probably still be going on and those guys would be trying to get by on strike pay and getting you know getting their necks felt by the uh, by the police every so often no doubt so you know as, a, as an object example of why you've got to have howard beckett as the general secretary of unite i don't think you can get a much better one really i don't think you can underestimate exactly what howard beckett did here. I mean, the whole reason people have been able to campaign and picket and strike and visibly during this entire pandemic period is because Howard Beckett worked so hard in the courtroom yeah. to make sure that they could legally. He worked on, it wasn't just Unite, he was working on behalf of here. It was the entire trade union movement that he opened the doors for so that their members could go out on a picket line and protest against bad work pay conditions, whatever it is, whatever grievance they've got against their employers at that time. If he hadn't done that, they still, to this day, possibly, would not be able to go out and strike. And they would be, you know, picketing from behind Zoom or something. I don't know. But the simple fact of the matter is they wouldn't be able to campaign in the way that traditionally they do that gets results. That is down to Howard Beckett. Yes, and I mean, interestingly, it's, it's another case in Northern Ireland. Sorry, Bonnie, I'll just throw this in because the, uh, was it Vistian Ford uh, result in was also in Northern Ireland, but that was a similar situation where a company was going bankrupt. The, uh, the members there were likely to be losing their pension entitlements. The ones in work were losing their jobs. And, uh, you know, it was court action again that saw those guys get the compensation that they needed and deserved. Uh, to you know, balance out the loss of loss of pensions and so on, which was life transforming, according to uh, Mr. Maguire when we had him on the other week, who was telling us about what had uh, what had gone on with all that. So again, you know, maybe Northern Ireland is the uh, is the beacon for the rest of the country, uh, rest of the UK. But um, you know, legal victories win industrial victories in a lot of cases, and uh, you know that seems to be uh, seems to be clear. Bonnie, sorry, I cut across you there. That's all right, Steve. I was just going to say, I think it's probably right to examine the idea that this general secretary election is three candidates against one candidate. But I actually think it's a fallacy to suggest that what we're looking at is three left wing candidates standing against one right wing candidate. I think what we've actually got on based on the research that you yourself, Steve, did on the pledges and the actions to date of each of the candidates, I think it's absolutely clear that there is one candidate who's going to stand up proudly and solidly for socialism, which we desperately need, versus three candidates that have declared that they're perfectly content to acquiesce with the neoliberal faction in the Labour Party and in society as a whole. 
And I think that makes it absolutely clear that there is one candidate that needs to be elected in this contest. And that the other three, if they want to fight between themselves for the spoils of if they want to um, agree one candidate to stand against Howard Beckett, who is the standalone candidate that represents the needs of all of the working class members of Unite the Union, then that's up to them. That's my personal opinion on that. And I also wanted to point out that obviously we know that the number of nominations received in the early process of an election campaign do not necessarily translate to votes as Damo uh, picked up on. If we looked, when we were looking at the leadership of the Labour Party, the contest in 2015, and if we looked at the number of, of nominations received from the Parliamentary Labour Party for Jeremy Corbyn, the argument was, again, in that contest of four candidates, the argument would fit that as Jeremy got the fewest nominations from the Parliamentary Labour Party in 2015, he should stand down. Bottom line is, everyone knew that that argument was a nonsense. Four candidates ran. One candidate was the runaway winner, and that was Jeremy Corbyn. So we mustn't forget that nominations are the votes of a particular select group within any organisation. What actually matters are the votes and the opinions of the membership. And we've seen that in the party. We all see it in our union as well. And the third thing I wanted to mention was the fact that the last general secretary election in um, Unite, which is cited as the reason that strangely two of the two of the three alleged left-wing candidates are set, uh, making a case for one of them to stand down um is on the basis of of um of of a, a split vote but the bottom line is if we have a standout candidate running in this contest with people as enthused as they are for howard beckett we are going to see turn up go through the roof and we are going to see Howard elected as a general secretary of Unite the Union who will pursue a progressive programme for all of our members. If they want to carry on trying to, to attack one of the candidates in a democratic process, what we will actually see is members decide that they don't want to vote for second best. People will not engage in the contest. We will see a reduced turnout, lower potentially than the 12% that was achieved last time. And that is exactly what will deliver a right-wing General Secretary of Unite the Union. So people need to be very, very careful what they wish for. Exactly that. Nobody's going to set up a second best. It's Beckett or bust. We've got this guy. He set out his manifesto. He's got his pledges. He stood on his soapbox. He's made his speeches. We like what we see. We like what we've read. We like what we hear. And this is the guy we want to vote for. And you expect us to accept that he's going to get shoved out, forced out, pushed out, however, and, and somebody else as well, just so we can unify behind one candidate who is called the unifier, the left candidate. Well, I'm not going to because... I've already made my choice out of these four. And if you tell me I can't have him now, then I'm going to go home and keep my ballot to myself. And I'm not <laughs> going to be the only person that's going to say this and do it as well. And it's, I'll come back to this argument as well, that you've got to have this, there's one candidate on the right and there's these three on the left. So as far as I'm concerned, there's one transparently open candidate and three who are not. There is one socialist candidate and three, mm, not so much. You can divide these four people up in any way, shape or form as you like, left versus right. That's not the issue at heart here. It's what they would do if they got in versus everybody else. And they've all got their own plans. They've all got their own manifestos. So can we stop the labels, please? You have four candidates, four different options, four very different uh, pledges and plans. So make your choice from those four. Stop trying to head, you know, pin them into... A, a, a broad bracket that just suits essentially one camp because it tends to be just the one camp that's making this argument and it, it really is a weak argument it's been ripped apart it's been ripped to shreds over several days now not just by me so well, i think the, the interesting the interesting things on it i mean we've seen the, you know this, this droning on about some nomination total and again it's you know there are question marks over it i won't go further than that just in a minute question marks over the totals uh, except in the case of Howard, who's, who's announced all of his as they went, has been completely transparent. But, you know, we've seen a more or less invisible campaign from all the others. You know, the occasional kind of snidey comment from the right winger to 
the friendly media and they amplify that for him or whatever. But, you know, we, we've seen very little in terms of, you know, being out there speaking to anyone from the other candidates. Uh, we've seen, you know, the, 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 all of them ducked numerous inv invitations to uh, go in head-to-head in, -head in a debate with, uh, with Howard Beckett. You know, they've all been pretty quiet. They've, you know, from my point of view, they've, uh, there've been very few responses to any media inquiries I've put to any of them. And they, they just seem to be trying this Boris Johnson hiding in the fridge approach of, you know, let's just keep out of the way because if we, if we appear in public, we'll damage our campaigns. That seems to be the kind of, you know, just looking from the outside in, seems to be what they're doing. Now that's fine. People play their strength in a campaign, do whatever. But the key thing, if you've got to hide your candidacy or your own candidacy in your own presence in order to try to, you know, avoid getting beaten by the guy that you're now trying to leave her out of the contest, then you probably shouldn't be the one that's on the ballot, you know, uh, certainly as a unity candidate. And so, you know, if at all, because the person who is not afraid to go, you know, or put it and faces critics, not afraid to go there and debate his ideas and defend what he wants to do with the union, is the person that's going to have to do that bloody job if he gets into the seat, because the media are going to be going at him all the time, assuming you're actually doing anything worth doing, and that's the big question. Um, you know, whereas we've seen with Howard Beckett, when the right-wing Labour MPs were trying to nobble him with all this bollocks a couple of weeks ago, he he went on, you know, and I happen to know from you know from from various sources that he essentially threatened Newsnight and said, "If you don't put me on, <laughs> then there might be legal consequences for that." So they put him on, and he made a similar warning to uh, the right wing MPs and said, "Be a bit careful what you say because you know you're a national tally and there can be consequences for this kind of stuff." And they were a bit they're not used to having somebody kind of actually confront them and stand up because generally when they're on the media, they they the tamest. You know, possible treatment from from ten journalists who are uh, who are just going to stenographize or whatever the word is, what they're saying. So you know, he was he's he, he did that with you, Damo. He went on and dealt with the smears that were circulating circulating about him before the uh, the nominations period even started. He gets straight on there and deals with the smears that come up on the media and and shows them up completely. Uh, you know, in the calmest way possible, unfazed, simply ha having the facts to hand and knowing how to deal with. You know, idiots who are trying to mount the smear campaign, essentially. And God, if only we'd had that in the you know the past five years, that the head of the Labour Party, things might be different. Um, and I love Jeremy, but you know that wasn't his strong point. You know, <laughs> and you know, and we've seen somebody who is able to articulate ideas, who is able to engage with people, so they get enthused about it. And you know, people have seen that now, and you can't dangle that in front of them, and then try and pull it away from them and assume that they're just all going to fall in line behind the, you know, the candidate that you decide you prefer because they're less troublesome, less likely to rock the boat, they're more likely to pre protect the status quo and people's kind of own individual interests or whatever. And that's the thing now that, but, you know, Pandora's box, the second time I've used that phrase, but Pandora's box is open. People have seen what it looks like, you know, the word hope has come up over and over again. Howard has given me hope. Beckett has given me hope. And finally, you know, after a, a year and a half of, desperation i've got hope again i can see that there's chance of something better and if you snatch that away from people they will not you know maybe a few will but you know many many will not simply line up and do what you want them to that we are not sheep you know unite members are not sheep they want hope and they want change and they want real you know and some of the some of the other candidates banding about the word change it's absolutely effing meaningless in their mouths but real change for the better real plans real vision people have seen that if you take that away from them they will not play the game and those who are claiming that they would you know that they're desperate to avoid a right way of getting in better bloody listen to that and think about it because the way they're going on with it at the moment is going to get them what they claim they're frightened of you know and that's leaving aside the, the idea that there may have been you know instances where some of those kind of uh softer left candidates let's say you know, their supporters might have had a little word in some branches to give Mr. Coyne a little nudge over the uh, over the line because, uh, you know, they were hoping that if he's in the race, they could force Beckett out because Howard Beckett is the one that they don't think they can beat, not Gerard Coyne. And I think that's the, you know, I'm, I'm doing a demo, excuse me, but, you know, that is the, uh, you know, that is the crux of this matter. People want hope, 
vision, actual leadership. And actual leadership gets up there in front and shows people what it's about. They don't hide and hope that nobody's going to notice that they haven't got it. Rent over. <laughs> I, I think that you're absolutely right there. People won't settle for second best anymore because we've been tantalizingly close to you know a life-changing leader uh, potential um prime minister that would have affected and improved all of our lives and all of our lots we've got so close before we are not going to back down and the bottom line is the key lesson i think that needs to be learned by those people that are suggesting that howard and for some reason only howard is the person that's being mentioned should stand aside um need to learn the lesson from what happened in the labor leadership contest just last year we were told that the approved left candidate was Rebecca Long Bailey. And unfortunately, as good as Rebecca Long Bailey is, she didn't inspire that hope, that passion and that commitment from the membership to go out and vote. And instead, we ended up with Keir Starmer and we all know where that's led us to. People don't need to be dictated to, dictated to about who they can and can't vote for. We're adults. We've taken the active decision to actually join a trade union. We know what things we want and expect from our dues paid to the union and what we need to see happen. So people need to, need to be treated with respect, not just the candidates, but the membership must be respected as well. And the wishes of the membership who have spoken so far must be respected. And the other point I just wanted to raise, sorry, I'm going on a rant now as well. <laughs> See what you started, Damo. Um, <laughs> my other thing you like, like it, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I've seen I've seen some people say on various social media threads that this election is not going to be won on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, what have you. The bottom line is historically, I think that that would be correct. We are living in a pandemic. Our lives have changed. We are no longer in our workplaces organising necessarily. A lot of people are still working remotely and quite likely that model is going to change going forward. What we need as a progressive leader of a trade union is someone who understands the need to reach out, create our own media, Unite TV, Socialist Telly, whatever, Squawk Box, all of these things, independent media that speak to our people, that tell the truth about what's going on. And only one candidate is forward thinking in a way that unions will be able to organise going um, going forward in potentially a forever changed workplace environment. And that candidate is Howard Beckett. This election absolutely can be won on social media because that's all we've got right now. The lockdown has been extended now by another four weeks. That's leading up to the end of July. This contest finishes in August. The other candidates have stood back from the opportunity of meeting the public and expressing what they actually stand for. They've turned it down time and again on socialist telly and in hustings. They actually refused to attend hustings if Howard was going to be there, which I think is absolutely remarkable. Um, if they're not prepared to take advantage of the technologies and the ways of communicating with the membership that they have available to them in these strange, strange times, how on earth will they ever lead a union in our new changed world that we're living in? Yeah, yeah, Belka, absolutely right. You've got, you know, I'll pick up on that point on social media, actually. Um, there is uh, only one candidate that you ever seem to see on social media. There's only one candidate that's actually embraced social media. There's only one candidate who has enthused and inspired, I'll use those words again, um, a, a whole slew of people across social media to the point his name was trending last night. Everybody else, and I, I, I tickled actually when Steve was speaking at the beginning when he saw he, he was, he, he'd seen the invisible campaign of uh, the other two candidates. Um, they say your eyesight's better than mine is then. Um, <laughs> although I've actually gone slightly fuzzy on the camera. I don't know if that's going to come back. There we go. Um, yeah, <laughs> I spoke at the wrong time, didn't I? Um, but uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a perfectly valid point. They are non-existent on social media. And that is symptomatic of their campaign. You might say that social media isn't going to win the campaign, but this is symptomatic of it because they're not engaging. They're not broadcasting anything. I'm not seeing anything from any other camp. All I know from these people is what I've looked up myself by doing your, you know, Googling them on, on the computer to see what they're actually saying or doing because there is nothing coming out in any form of messaging. Whereas you've got memes, you've got messages flaming Nora. Howard Beckett came out on a tin of soup the other day. It's, <laughs> he's everywhere. 
but nobody else. Well, the, fun, the funny thing that went on as well, Demo, don't forget, is that there, there was another Beckett who thought it was all about him at one point. Um, <laughs> Beckett, yes. <laughs> which, because uh, the comedian uh, Beckett decided, uh, you know, start, he, de he deleted him quite quick, but he put a few tweets out saying, uh, apparently I'm supposed to unite things and fix them. But, it, you know, it shows the reach and the level that that was kind of trending at, that it, it you know, it, got on his radar enough to uh, for him to feel as I had to comment on it. And, uh, you know, I think that's, you know, reach on social media is one thing, but it's not just social media, it's any kind of media, really, that there's been, you know, very little apart from, you know, uh, I think of a short appearance on a, on a 10 journalist program by one of the candidates that have, um, you know, the, the, the others have, have done at all. They just, it does seem to be this Boris Johnson in a fridge tactic and it worked for him with the mass media kind of, you know, helping him and the Labour Party, you know, working against its leader and, and undermining him on Brexit and everything else. Uh, you know, but but this is not that. Um, but I think, you know, the other interesting aspect of that, just to finish off, is that we saw similar in the PCS union where Mark Savotko was, you know, with the, put a lot of pressure on him to, uh, to get him to step down in favour of somebody a bit more, you know, what would you call them? bland, um, you know, and, and he refused and, and then, you know, and, and look at him now and, you know, and, and it's, it's labor, but it's not, you know, the, the idea, you just think so, the idea of simply putting somebody out and saying they're, they're a bit less bad than the other person. We've seen what, what happened with that, you know, with Keir Starmer. And I mean, he's, he'll be lucky if he survives, you know, much beyond the uh, battle and spend by election where, you know, labor is apparently reporting that they're getting disastrous, results when they're going out on the doorstep talking to people yeah. um you know no doubt they're trying to get their excuses in early and blame george galloway for the uh you know for it as though he's the 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 big bogeyman or whatever but you know the fact of the matter is you know for keir starmer simply not to be boris johnson is is not good you know he's not good enough in the eyes of others that's not going to win him over from somebody who is you know he's a he's a monster but at least he's you know Got a little bit of entertainment about him, you know, and that's that's enough to, you know, to be defeating Labour at the minute. And God, that needs to change. But you know, first off, let's have change in Unite, where we're going to get the person in charge that the members will understand, engage with, you know, uh, feel for, and and all the rest of it. And who's engaging with them, you know, which is which is is not happening anywhere else. No. So I think we'll we'll end it on that note. Um, thank you everybody who's born with us for the uh, very fractionally over long program tonight and uh, slightly late start but I think it's in the end been worth it and worth persevering through the uh, sound issues from the guys at their uh, Baker's conference as well but uh, yeah what a, what a week it's been and what a, a summer it threatens to be um, hang in there don't listen to the rumours don't believe everything that uh, other people tell you we'll always keep you straight but um, you know, keep the faith and feck it back, back it. I think is the uh, is the message to end with on that. So uh, social media stuff, blah blah. Click notify, etc. And uh, thank you for for giving us your time. If you watch some catch up, thank you for that as well. And do spread the word so that people get to find out what's going on. Take care, everybody.